Welcome to the Arnold Arboretum. The Arnold Arboretum is one of the great treasures of Harvard University, one of the great arboretums and botanical gardens in the world, and a place of very serious research. What you may not know is it is one of the earliest and most continuous places of interaction between Harvard and China. We've shown you in earlier modules many of our physical collections from China. Uh, you remember Langdon Warner's wonderful Bodhisattva, not his own, but the one that he took. Well, here we have many things from China, many of which have found their way back to China uh, as part of more than a century of scientific exchange between Harvard and China through the auspices of the Arnold Arboretum. Why does Harvard have an arboretum here in Boston, far away <laughs> from Cambridge, and on what I understand is a 1,000-year lease? In the 1870s, uh, some money was created through the death of a, a whaling merchant from New Bedford, uh, James Arnold. And it was partnered with some land, the Bussey Estate, which is the land on which the Arnold Arboretum here sits uh, in Boston, to create this great outdoor natural history collection of plants. And the goal was to grow anything, woody and, and otherwise, that could grow in the climates of Boston, and to create one of the great plant collections. And the first director of the Arnold Arboretum, Charles Sprague Sargent, uh, saw this amazing opportunity, but one that in fact certainly exceeded Harvard's ability. Even his ambitions could not be fulfilled by Harvard's ambitions and their capacity. And so he turned to one of the great landscape figures in the history of, of the modern world, and that's Frederick Law Olmsted. And Frederick Law Olmsted was busy thinking about creating one of the great park systems in an urban environment, and that is the Emerald Necklace of Boston. The goal was to create this institution that would be both a great horticultural and public park, landscaped by Olmsted, as well as the premier holdings of plants for study, teaching, and horticultural display. And in doing so, Harvard donated all of the land to the city of Boston. In return, Boston would lease that land back to Harvard University for a thousand years for a dollar a year. The city would build the streets and the paths and the stone walls and the water lines and Harvard would then in perpetuity care for and build this great botanical collection. So that's our birth. So here's this institution that's born locally. So the question is how do we become the first part of Harvard University to have serious engagement with China? And it begins actually in the 1890s when Charles Sprague Sargent, as he built the collections that are here on the grounds to this day, turned towards Asia. And he went on a trip to Japan, which was a collecting trip. He returned with many extraordinary specimens of Japanese plants, many of which probably had not been grown in the New World and certainly had not been brought to other botanic gardens. And as a consequence of this stimulus, he began to see through other explorations that were going on that China was sort of the great frontier, uh, that there was biodiversity in China that no one else had, and that if it was brought to the Arnold Arboretum could be partnered with our American and, and European collections. And so in 1906, he actually hired one of the preeminent plant explorers. His name was E.H. Wilson, Ernest Henry Wilson. Uh, he was an Englishman who had worked with the premier horticultural firm in England, Veatch, uh, that had sent him to China, in fact, for a single plant. He'd gone, I believe it's 1902, mm -hmm. and he was after one thing to sell, obviously, in England to everyone who had an estate. And this was the dove tree, or the handkerchief tree. And we'll actually see that when we go up to the top of Bussey Hill, some of the oldest specimens outside of China. This dove tree is something that is magnificent and when it flowers, it has these beautiful pairs of white bracts, and uh, he went there just to get that material back to England. Well, Sargent saw that he was extraordinarily well versed in moving through China. Uh, he had a number of partnerships with Chinese collectors, uh, people who were knowledgeable about plants, and Sargent hired him on behalf of the Arnold Arboretum and sent him to China. And this is, when we say send, we mean not just for a month or two months, we mean for three years. And it's there that our collections that are so heavily uh, influenced by Chinese biodiversity essentially are born. And we'll see again on the ground things that E.H. Wilson collected as a seed in 1907 still grow as magnificent specimen trees here, but they represent a piece of biodiversity in the wild brought to Boston and the Arnold Arboretum. So China and New England seem so of course, they are far apart, and they seem so climatologically different, uh, at least today, mm -hmm. to me. 
Uh, how do these things thrive here, uh, coming all the way from China? Well, that's a great question. And, and, and you really think, uh, of all the places where we might have partnerships, you might think, well, let's just go over to uh, Europe and you right, might find right. some great German trees, and we have them, and, and you might go over to the Czech Republic and you'd see all of these things. But in fact, uh, as was discovered at Harvard by Asa Gray, the professor of botany, who was Darwin's great friend and uh, correspondent and also great defender, really Darwin's first defender uh, in America, Asa Gray began to describe a lot of the floras of North America, and he began to understand that there was this relationship, an evolutionary relationship, between many of the plants of Eastern North America and of Eastern Asia, meaning Japan and Eastern China. And that many of the things that we think of as emblematic of New England, or of, let's say, the mid-Atlantic states, their closest living relative actually is in China or in Japan. And there are these pockets where the zonations in terms of climate and a lot of other growing conditions are very similar. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we're pre-adapted in essence to grow Chinese plants. And uh, the wonderful thing is over the last 30 million years, evolution has been tossing Asian plants over the Bering Straits, yes. uh, down through the Americas, and they have happily made their own homes. And they stuck here. They did. But now we've gone back, and what we've done is we've repatriated 30 million years of evolutionary history between China or Asia and North America. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. We have some incredible exhibits here of the history of the Arnold Arboretum in China. The story of the Dawn Redwood ah. is something <laughs> where we can feel here at Harvard, I think, very proud yeah. of our collaboration with China. This is an extraordinary story of how our collaboration, which began in 1906 between the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University and China, continues through the middle part of the last century and, and of course to today. But in the 1940s, uh, there were people who were still discovering new plants that had not been described to science and weren't known. And at one point, a group of botanists discover a plant that they had not seen before. We now know it's the Dawn Redwood tree or Meta Sequoia. Now the tree was actually known it's not that it's a mystery to us. If you go to the fossil record, there are all kinds of fossils of dawn redwoods. You can find them in Oregon, in the United States. You can find them in Japan. You can find them everywhere. They're beautiful deciduous conifers. Their needles drop each fall. They turn an extraordinary color of gold. And all of a sudden, it's realized that this plant might be something that is actually what we thought was extinct, the last fossil record being two million years ago. Well, in comes Hu Shan Su one of modern China's most famous botanists, or who we refer to as H.H. Hu, for those of us who are not so good at the pronunciation. And he was in China, and he was the one who actually began to get the material together to describe the species and ultimately to move it to the Arnold Arboretum. But before I tell the story, it seems to me, of, of how that material came to the Arboretum and what it did then to biodiversity around the world, it might be nice if Lisa told us why H.H. Hu had the association with the Arnold Arboretum. Association, yes. He actually, H.H. Um, Hu had uh, initially um, taken his undergraduate degree at the University of California, gone back to China, um, had um, worked in academia, and began to send um, plant specimens to the Arnold Arboretum uh, in the early 1920s. This was a very common way of botanists to introduce each other to introduce themselves to each other is to send specimens and, and develop a relationship. Um, he then, in 1923, um, came here to the Arnold Arboretum and matriculated at the Bussey Institution, which was our sister institution. But he specifically came to study with John George Jack, who was um, a dendrologist on our staff, an educator, a plant explorer himself, uh, and um, a very long, long serving member of our staff. Jack uh, had um, actually mentored uh, a number of Chinese students uh, starting in the 19 teens uh, and continued this relationship up into the 1940s to quite late in his life, actually. Um, he, uh, he worked uh, with um, Chinese students as they came and mentored them, and then they went back to China and uh, had ongoing uh, relationships uh, with him uh, as a mentor. 
who returned to China after uh, taking a Doctor of Science degree uh, from the Busse Institution through Harvard, and uh, then uh, trained a generation of Chinese botanists, uh, and uh, was a contact for the Arnold Arboretum in country um, that we had a very close relationship with for until 1949, really, when China uh, closed. So. You know, he was the head of the Botanical Society of China, mm -hmm. and he also the founder of the Lushan Botanical Garden uh, in, in Jiangxi province. He, he has this seminal role uh, in China with the Botanical Society, with the Fan Institute of Biology, which is really the, the beginnings of, this, of modern biology uh, in China, and a, really a predecessor to the Chinese Academy of Sciences uh, and a lot of their biological work. So he receives these plants, and he begins to describe them, and ultimately the descriptions, the initial descriptions of this plant that had thought, we thought had left the earth two million years earlier, show us that the thing that's in the rocks is still there in China. Now, this is one of the great things. Immediately, there's collecting that's done, and the descriptions are made, and you can see there was correspondence about all of this, but ultimately, the beauty of being a botanist is that no one owns biodiversity, and it's, it, when you have good partnerships, it's all about sharing the, the spoils of evolution. And one of the great things, and culture, is that he then arranged for the Arnold Arboretum to be the first institution to receive seed of the Dawn Redwood. A kilo of seed. A kilo Yes, a to seed. be precise. And, and th these are slightly smaller than palm seeds, yeah. so uh, it's a lot of seeds. We have on the grounds the original plantings of the 1948 accessions of the uh, Dawn Redwood. We have several that are still standing here. But the fact is, not only did we then plant some of the material, but as botanical institutions do, we then shared that seed with the world. And no matter where you go, if you are on a university campus or you're in a city or you're on any kind of property where you see a Dawn Redwood tree that was planted any time really in the late 1940s or early 1950s, we can assure you it came from the Arnold Arboretum because we're the ones who shared it with the world. Uh, and here we have Ned and Hu Shen Su uh, next to each other, although not in giving time, sadly. <laughs> uh, a bust of Hu Shen Su uh, that you can find in the Fairy Lake Botanical Garden in Shenzhen. Uh, so it's an extraordinary story. It is. And Thank it's, you. And it's part of China's heritage in the sense of having this wonderful thing. And now we all and share it. And here in Boston, you may not notice that those of you who come as tourists to Boston, but uh, even before you get to the Arnold Arboretum, but in the Boston Public Garden, there's a grove, a small grove, mm -hmm. which must have been from exactly that. Of course, yeah. of so. course. Yeah. So. Well, thank you. So we'll come over and look at these glass plates. Yeah. Ernest Wilson uh, was uh, given the order by Charles Sargent to get the best camera that he possibly could buy, best that money could buy, and then get instructions on how to use that camera. And we are blessed that he was a natural born uh, photography artist. As we can see from this photograph of a uh, ficus lacor, um, a fig tree, a giant fig tree uh, in Wanxian, just had an eye for composition, catching the, the perfect photograph. We're fortunate to hold all of his glass plate negatives. He, he traveled across China with a camera with a big bellows on a tripod, a tall tripod, very sturdy wooden, uh, and traveled with his quarters uh, with all of these glass plates, um, about 700 or 800 at a time. And he would take a photograph, he would pack that negative then back up, and they weren't uh, developed until he actually returned to England. Um, so he took this lovely photograph of ficus um, fairly early in his uh, expedition, and he never saw it again for, uh, for about three years. We have a almost 2,500 Wilson glass plate negatives from Eastern Asia. And that is in addition to glass plate negatives that he took of uh, notable New England trees and views of, of our trees um, and uh, plant specimens here on the Arnold Arboretum grounds. We've also been fortunate uh, that we have digitized all of these photographs from the original glass plate negatives. They are free and available online. Anyone can search them and discover our collections. Now, yeah. he was, it wasn't that easy to no. do what he was doing, <laughs> no. wandering all over China, even with a passport mm -hmm. and even with a, and particularly yes. maybe with a heavy camera. 
Maybe you can tell us there was, there was one time where he ran into some serious oh. trouble. Maybe you can tell us that story. <laughs> he, he surely did. Um, he was um, exploring um, in uh, far northwest Sichuan, somewhat south of the city of Songpan uh, today, tall cliffs and very narrow pathways along the cliffs. And he was caught uh, in an avalanche. It crushed his leg. Um, he had to have his legs splinted with his camera tripod. Thank heavens he had such a smart yep, tripod. Smart guy. <laughs> and uh, his errors uh, had to carry him out on a stretcher from this area far out in the middle of nowhere, basically. Uh, and uh, as they were coming down this, you know, very narrow path, they met a mule train, a hundred mule mule train. <laughs> and had to place Ernest Wilson, who I'm sure, you know, was suffering in terrible pain, crossways on the path, and each mule had to step over him. The path was that narrow. The Chinese men who collected for him, who collected with him for his expeditions for Beach Nursery, and then again uh, for his uh, Harvard expeditions, um, we have photographs of them here. It's a wonderful the, picture. The caption yeah. of this is, um, my, uh, my Chinese collectors, all faithful right. and true. His partners in China. His partners in China. And I think that this is one of the really you know, extraordinary images because what uh, it, it says about our institutional relationship mm -hmm. with China is rather special. So many countries from the Western world came to other parts of the world, not necessarily as partners, but for other reasons that were potentially unequal in relationship and, and there was the potential for exploitation. Mm -hmm. But from the very beginning of Arnold's uh, history in, in China, what you had was this extraordinary deep and passionate relationship between people in China who were collectors, who were knowledgeable about uh, geography and plants and biodiversity, mm -hmm. partnered with somebody who also shared their passion and their love of China. So this was a relationship of equals from the very beginning, and I think you know not only does the caption uh, really say something very great and very wonderful, but as you see, the fact that they came back expedition after expedition, it was the same people who worked yeah. for that is a actually decade. very interesting. This says Hu Zhao, passport. <laughs> this is a larger passport than I <laughs> normally carry, and it's given by the Wai Wu Bu, by the foreign ministry of the great Qing dynasty in 1910 yep. from the uh, second expedition this must have been ernest wilson's passport and it was so what you're looking at here are, are two of the seven or eight or nine uh, passport or permits that were issued to uh, e.h wilson um, as is true today uh, we collect plants and we do it as best we can legally and with the full acknowledgement of our host countries who are sharing their biodiversity heritage with us. And as you can see here, even a century ago, uh, the Arnold Arboretum made sure that E.H. Wilson had the correct permits, not only to travel in certain parts of China, but even to carry a hunting rifle. So Lisa, tell us about this book of stunning paintings. This is Pierre Joseph Buckle's Collection Precieuse and Illuminé des Fleurs de Chine. We call it Fleur de Chine. And uh, we feel very fortunate that this is uh, one of our approximately 550 uh, rare books in our collection here in the Arnold Arboretum. I mean, not only rare, but absolutely stunning. stunning. These are his engravings or his uh, drawings that were done into engravings of Chinese plants in a Chinese fashion. Now, bear in mind, this is published in 1776, quite the craze for chinoiserie uh, in Europe and in France at that time. This other volume has illustrations of Chinese plants in a more European style. They're very notable. They have a very notable binding by a very well-known French bookbinder of the period, de Rome, who was a very fashionable bookbinder for the French royal family. Both these volumes were collected by Charles Sargent sometime around 1906 or thereabouts, the time that um, Wilson was being sent huh? to explore. Okay.
I have no idea how he would know so many Chinese prints. Would there have been drawings brought back possibly by Jesuits or others uh, yes, in the 18th, yes. 17th and 18th century? Uh, there certainly were floras of um, Chinese and Asian plants which had uh, made it to Europe by that point. These would have been engraved and the engravings uh, would have been black and white and then they would have been hand colored oh, uh, with okay. watercolor. Mm -hmm. So there's, I mean, uh, if, and the coloration and as of this period, the paper doesn't turn brown because this predates the use of wood pulp with acid content and, uh, the, of the 19th century, mid to late. So in some ways, this is as it was when first published. It's as vibrant, uh, it's as beautiful. The compositions are typical of that period with not only a plant, but also potentially mm -hmm. at least one animal, an insect or a bird, or perhaps both. Uh, and this would have been very characteristic both of American and of European compositions of of biodiversity. The Arnold Arboretum is about 281 acres, so think of it as a beautiful piece of property, a mile long by a half mile wide. We have about 15,000 documented curated plants. Each one we care for, we know, we follow, it's in our GIS systems. Uh, they're from all over the world, but particularly from Asia and North America. And we're going to go out and look at some of these plants that connect to the very things we've been talking about here in our archives. The stories are in the archives, and the plants actually live on the grounds. Great. Thank you, Ned. We thought we'd go just quickly to the greenhouses to see the rare and endangered plant. Okay. And then from there, we'll go up to the top of Bussy Hill. We're here at the propagation facility at the Arnold Arboretum, uh, where plants are brought to life uh, and then nourished uh, in order to be planted here and elsewhere around the world. And looking at one item here in front of us at the propagation facility, to the untrained eye, and my eyes are totally untrained in matters uh, botanical, as my wife, who's a very good gardener, knows, this just looks to me like a bunch of weeds. Exactly. To an untrained eye, it might look a little bit like a bunch of weeds, but we've got a little experiment going on here that Steve will, will tell you a little bit about, but the subject is a very rare maple known mm -hmm. as Acer Yang Bienz. It's native to Yunnan province uh, on the, uh, the edge of uh, with, with Burma, Myanmar. And this is one of the rarest of the rare maples. Discovered in 2002 as just a small population of maybe a dozen plants. Since that time, it's down to maybe four plants in the wild. Uh, during that period, we received three seedlings uh, to do some genetic analysis in order to find out how that maple was related to some other species. Of, of maples, and since that time we've been able to keep this in the collection. Uh, it's not hardy out of doors here in Boston, and so we've been keeping it inside uh, during the winters. Uh, but it's so rare, uh, we want to make sure that we move heaven and earth, so to speak, in order to propagate it, to generate new ones. And my colleague here, Steve Schneider, uh, can tell a little bit about that story. Yeah, sure. So one of the, one of the challenges with this plant is that it's not um, hardy to the, to the Boston climate, so we have to keep it in pots so that we can um, uh, bring it indoors. Sideway pots? Well, they're regular pots. Or did pots. they fall they're over? Just, they're, they're, <laughs> we, 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 we fall them over. Um, okay. And so uh, basically what we're doing here is we've taken a plant in a pot, we've dug a hole into the ground, we've laid it on its side, and essentially buried it. Um, before we buried the plant, we selected several of the branches, we wounded the branches and put a rooting hormone in. And the whole idea is that each of those branches will then produce uh, a, a new plant that we can then send to sister institutions that will actually might be able to grow it outdoors um, and in the ground because growing them in pots is not the, the ideal way to preserve a species. And these. Um uh, Those lines, lines yeah. going into it, is it electrosis it's, or it's, is it <laughs> Frankenstein-like bringing nothing, them to life? Nothing, or? nothing is no. as complicated as just water. It's a, it's a drip system okay. um, that's going directly into the pot and keeping the, the root system moist. Because before uh, the, the ground freezes, we will have to uh, write these pots up and, and bring them back in. So we want to preserve the roots. We, while we're, we're producing uh, additional plants, we still want to preserve the root system mm -hmm. uh, that, that's, that's feeding the mother plant. Terrific. Thank yeah. you very much. So one of the things I'll just mention is that this goes back to this century of collaboration between botanic gardens. It's really centuries around the world, but 
people don't own biodiversity or what evolution has produced. We share it with each other. And in this case, uh, we have the expertise to actually take the rarest of the rare and be the one link that prevents it from disappearing after all these years of life, uh, billions of years of life history, uh, disappearing forever. So when we get these things propagated, we will share them with other gardens. We can repatriate back to China or to any of the other rare and endangered plants here. But we become this sort of bank account where by distributing among many banks your rarest of rare, you're assured that if there's one bank robbery or loss, you ultimately don't lose everything. So this is a very important part of what we do. Well, thank you, Ben. So we're here on the Chinese path of the Explorer's Garden here at the Arnold Arboretum. And Michael, you are an explorer. So tell, tell us about the Chinese path. Well, this is a fantastic area. We're situated on Bussy Hill, mm -hmm. and there's this garden that we call the Explorer's Garden. It celebrates our, our spirit of exploration. Uh, the explorers from the day of Will, age of Wilson all the way up to contemporary explorers like myself and explorers for the next uh, 860 years of the Arboretum's tenure. It also celebrates our, our experimentation with new plants where we have plants from around the world, cousins that are brought together, uh, plants uh, like we've got these beautiful stewardias uh, that are members of the tea family. And you might have an American species right next to its Asian species cousin. We walk down and, yeah. and take a look at a few other. Yeah. Sure. Do you want to walk over here? Maybe see the uh, Acer grissium. Acer grissium. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is one of my favorite maple trees in the whole wide world. It was also Ernest Henry Wilson's uh, one of his favorites. In fact, when he had collected it, uh, he didn't even know to which species this belonged. But he wrote Acer spa, an unknown maple species, and he said, "The finest maple in Hupei." And uh, he collected it in 1901 during a trip, and then again in 1907. And this is actually one of the two oldest ones in North America. The other one is in the Arboretum, just down a little bit lower. Uh, so it's, uh, it celebrated its 100th birthday uh, seven years ago. Uh, and it's uh, a beautiful species. Uh, it has this characteristic papery, flaky bark mm -hmm. uh, that has, can be deep red uh, and uh, to orange. Uh, and there's a little bit of subtle variation in them based on uh, individuality and their age. Uh, but it's a, it's a fantastic specimen. So forgive me for knowing nothing um, about uh, maples, except that I usually can recognize a maple leaf. And if uh, a Canadian were to come down and uh, <laughs> try to find his or her national flag on this tree, I think they would not do so. What makes it a maple? These leaves are actually, what you're looking at um, is what no, what's known as a compound leaf. So a leaf in this sense comprises three smaller leaflets. You'll see some small fruits, um, uh, maybe an, an inch and a half long, mm -hmm. that look like the characteristic uh, helicopters, or botanically we'd call it a samara. Yes. And uh, that's a great indication, looking at the reproductive structures, that this is indeed a maple. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can see maybe a few of them, keys or, or helicopters or samaras yes, sure. hanging from a branch up there. Well, How is the paper bark maple doing in China itself today? Unfortunately, it's uh, it's on the rare and endangered list in, in China. Uh, and so the, the, the plant occurs primarily in, in western Hubei, uh, somewhat in Shanxi and Sichuan, but fragmented. Uh, sometimes just one individual in a population. Uh, other times you might see a, a population that comprises maybe 10. It's unfortunate that it's uh, because of forest uh, fragmentation that they've become isolated and it's, it's not doing as well. Uh, but that just shows the importance of going out and collecting, documenting where the, uh, the populations exist, and working with our colleagues in China to, uh, uh, to, to back them up, to study them, collect them, bring them back here, understand maybe how to, to better grow them, uh, understand how to coax those seeds to germinate, and then repatriate. Is there an arboretum? like this to be found uh, in contemporary China? Well, there are a number. Many of the, uh, the Chinese Academy of Science gardens uh, uh, have very strong research programs, and also some of the municipal gardens, like the Beijing Botanic Garden, have become uh, right. uh, moved away from being purely an ornamental collection uh, to having a, some scientific acronym. Great. Thank you. And then here, of course, is our dove tree. Does that mean that this is a tree that doves like to nest in, or why do we? Well, possibly, but uh, the real name it was uh, the real reason it was given that moniker is that uh, doesn't look like it much of anything now. But if you were here about six weeks earlier, you'd see a small cluster of flowers that you would barely even notice, but they would be 
surrounded by two leaf-like bracts, similar like what you'd find in a poinsettia, only these are alabaster white. And so they look like the cascading wings of a dove or maybe a pocket handkerchief, which is another one of its common names. Uh, it has a great story. Um, Ernest Henry Wilson was sent uh, for his very first trip. He was 23 years old, was sent across several oceans uh, from England to uh, Hubei and Sichuan, uh, where he uh, collected this. And he was sent there to find one species and one thing only. Basically. This tree? This tree. And uh, uh, so he, uh, it took him uh, uh, quite the, it was quite the trek to, uh, to even find where the tree was supposed to be growing. And interestingly enough, he had a, a crude map that had X marks the spot. And when he found that spot, he found a stump and a recently repaired house. Oh. Uh, he wrote in his diary that evening, I did not sleep a wink that night. And you can imagine. Uh, but luckily for him, he did find a few other uh, trees in the vicinity and was able to collect uh, oodles of seed and ship them back to, uh, uh, back to England. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew, can you tell me, what, is it, what does it take to keep up even just one part of this enterprise, for example, the Chinese path? It takes a lot of resources. Uh, and it also takes a lot of planning. I mean, thinking about um, who's using the collection, where did it come from, and what's going to be the best situation to maintain the vigor of that plant long term. Mm -hmm. And what's the biggest challenge? One of the things we talk about a, a lot is, um, again, where that plant came from. Mm. And so it, it, it's adapted to a certain environment, and we're bringing it into a foreign environment. And so it might not be as hardy as uh, it would elsewhere in this collection. And so you stress out a plant like that, and it's more prone to disease and insects and other things. So um, it's about finding the, the right niche in the landscape where it's going to perform uh, the best. Okay. Well, Ned, as you look uh, to the future and the future of the Arboretum's collaborations with China, what do you see as the opportunities? Well, I, I think it's it's really drawing on this century-long heritage and partnership between people in North America and at Harvard and the Arnold Arboretum in China who share a passion for the Chinese plants and their relatives in, in North America. And one of the reasons it's so great to have Michael off collecting and to have a variety of different people going back and forth in Chinese botanical gardens visiting us is that we hope to keep adding more and more of the wonderful biodiversity of China so that everyone who comes to Boston can have that first taste of what is one of the most biodiverse hotspots on the planet. Well, thank you. I want to thank Michael and Steve and Andrew and Ned, uh, the whole team here at Arnold Arboretum. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs>